Hello and welcome to this edition of CSA Talks today. I am Aisha Subarkar, TRT World Anchor, and I'm joined by Parakhanna. He's a leading geopolitical expert and author of, if I'm not mistaken, eight books, including his latest, as you can see behind him, Move Forces Uprooting Us. Parak, let's begin with that, your, your latest book. I mean, talk to us about these forces. What are they? Who are they? And what are they trying to do? Well, thank you, Aisha. Well, this is a book about the future of human geography. Why does that matter? Because that is the geography of us. There are 8 billion human beings and where we are located is going to change radically in the years ahead. Why? Because of the great forces that are driving human mobility and migration. Number one is demographic imbalances. Think about the labor shortages in Europe in North America, in Japan, the countries of the Northern Hemisphere, the OECD countries are aging rapidly. They have a, a insufficient young people in the country and there is a global imbalance in the geography of old and young people. But aging countries need young people, need taxpayers, entrepreneurs, workers, doctors, students, homeowners, and all of these populations for their future, and they don't have them. And that is in the 20th century, the largest driver of migration. And still the situation is more acute than it has ever been before. So that's one reason. Another, of course, is political violence, civil wars, international wars. Turkey is home to the largest number of refugees of any country in the entire world. Yeah. Mexico is home to Central American refugees. Afghanistan has fallen apart again. And, and so many countries are still on the brink of chaos. Yes. Then there's economic crises. Think about the financial crisis and the impact of COVID. There's technological disruptions because of automation and robotics. And even remote work is allowing people to move and relocate because of digital work. And then, of course, there's climate change. So if you take all of these factors together, and remember, there are more climate migrants today then there are political refugees or economic migrants already now in the 21st century. So it's demographic imbalances, it's political upheaval, it's economic uh, uh, crises, it's technological disruption and climate change, the five great forces that are moving people all over the world. So um, you're trying to draw attention to the already devastating effects of the climate change. I would rather just call it a climate crisis. Um, where are we? Where do we stand? If carbon emissions even stop today, effects are already here. What should be done moving forward? That's exactly right. It's very important that you say that because a lot of people think that the climate can be reset to a better time, to the climate of 1990, the climate of uh, 1900, of 1800. That is not the way a complex system works. In a complex system, it never returns to what it was. It is always going to change. A place that has drought is going to be stuck with drought. And that is something that we have to deal with. Sea levels will continue to rise for hundreds of years. So we have to invest in adaptation. And what I focus on in this book is not just mitigation, which is the technological issue of reducing emissions, of uh, re removing carbon from supply chains, from greening industries. I focus on adaptation. In our day-to-day -day lives, where should people resettle? What kind of infrastructure should we build? What are the geographies where people can best survive? What are the energy efficient and water efficient um, uh, technologies and modes of architecture that can help us to lead a more sustainable and mobile lifestyle as a civilization, especially the people who live in coastal mega cities and other uh, vulnerable parts of the world? So you're talking about the importance of adaptation, but that needs a political will, a collective will. So um, what's your, for example, uh, take on the latest COP26 uh, summit? Was it a success? Was it a failure? Why do you think the world leaders aren't taking this um, climate crisis seriously? What's holding them back? 
they may be taking it seriously, but as you said, there is not enough collective will. Now, even if there is collective will and collective action on reducing emissions, it is going to take many, many years to play out. Some countries have set targets to 2040, 2060 to decarbonize. But climate adaptation is a problem for now, for yesterday, for tomorrow. We must act on adaptation right away. And there, there is no collective action. It is local. It is what will the people of the Middle East do? What will the people of Africa do? What will the people of the United States do where there are uh, forest fires, where there's droughts, where there's heat waves, where there's rising, rising sea levels, where there's uh, hurricanes and typhoons, the people of India, where, there, where suddenly you have what are called a zero day water events, where there's no water in the city. That is happening now. So adaptation is what we have to focus on. And this means that our economies, public investment has to go into the newest technologies, the newest urban planning systems, the newest agriculture, the newest renewable energy modes. That is where our economies need to focus our attention at a national level and a regional level. But what about the poor countries? I mean, let's take some poor African countries, let's say some poor Middle Eastern countries where we see military conflicts. How would they act to adapt to this climate crisis? Well, they are learning that they have to invest more in local agriculture in case uh, food supplies are cut off, food prices are spiking because of border closures and the pandemic and supply chain disruptions. And even if their geography is becoming more difficult for growing food, there are technologies, water, uh, uh, sort of uh, seeds that don't require as much water intensity, indoor farming, uh, greenhouses, hydroponic and aquaponic farming. These are things, again, where public and private budgets and investment need to import these technologies so that places can become more resilient. So conserving water, growing more food, uh, managing your urban space to reduce heat, you know, the design of buildings to channel uh, air for wind and cooling, all of these kinds of retrofits, as they're known, to our infrastructure are where we need to be investing for climate adaptation. And also, of course, migration, internally moving people from less, uh, from more vulnerable areas to less vulnerable areas. And this is what I'm observing all over the world. And remember, the context for all of this is also demographics. How do you optimize your economies around the people that you have when the world population is actually starting to shrink? We will not achieve economic growth if you have low productivity, high inequality, and not enough participation in the labor force. So we have to think of our world population as finite. For the last 100 years, I said, actually, the world population is quadrupled from 2 billion people in 1920 to 8 billion people today. But now it is stopping. And that means that we have to make the most of our populations if we want to see economic growth. But still, according to the forecast, climate crisis, for example, will force 1.2 billion people to leave their home countries by 2050. So th that, that's a very scary prediction, but where will these people go? And is this inevitable? It is inevitable. It's already happening. I think that number is too small. Uh, we will probably be 2 billion people. That is what I talk about in the book. And I look at the specific geographies of origin and the destinations. A lot of it, of course, is regional. More Central Americans will move to North America. More Africans will try to move to Europe. More Africans will circulate within Africa to Southern or Central Africa, where you have more forests and more rivers. Many Arab and Persian people will move to Eastern Turkey. And actually, in this book, I, I have traveled in Turkey so many times, and I have driven across Turkey and taken trains across Turkey. And I write about the Eastern Anatolian Highlands, which is the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And mm -hmm. Eastern Turkey actually is a whole chapter in this book, because I look at how verdant it is, how agriculturally fertile it is, but how the population has declined because Turkish people have been moving from east to west. So now you have this terrain in which actually millions of people could live, but you have very few, uh, much smaller population than you used to. 
I talk about Canada. I talk about Russia. I write a lot about Kazakhstan. The population of Kazakhstan was uh, 20 million about a decade ago. I predict it could have 100 million people, 150 million people. So I am talking about some very radical changes. Yeah, Kazakhstan is very interesting. I mean, I believe you took a deep look in Kazakhstan, but what about other Central Asian countries like Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan? What's the situation there? Well, what I do is evaluate locations, not just for their climate stability, but also their politics, their economics, their immigration policy. Do they have the strategy to um, diversify their economies, to absorb more people, to employ people, to maintain stability, to cope with environmental volatility, to manage their geopolitical risks. It takes a lot of smart decisions to navigate all of those issues that I just mentioned. Kazakhstan is actually doing it well. Uh, the, the government of Kazakhstan is a client of my company. I work very closely with many governments to help them on exactly these issues of strategy. How do you promote investment? What infrastructure to build? How do you employ domestic and foreign people more productively? And in Kazakhstan, you see this happening. So I describe Kazakhstan at length, but I also talk about the, uh, the, the assets and liabilities of other countries in the region, like Uzbekistan and so forth. And I spend a fair bit of time talking about uh, Russia and other parts of Central Asia as well, and even Japan and other countries that are climate resilient. So, for example, do you talk to the uh, Turkish officials? As you've just mentioned, I mean, Turkey is hosting 4.1 million, uh, 5 million refugees, and they're likely to stay here. But most of them, in a way, want to go to Europe. And we've seen how the European Union has been reacting to it. I don't know, what did you feel when you saw the latest um, refugee crisis happened in the um, Polish and Belarusian border? People were stranded there, they were pushed back. So there's this European look at refugees and I believe it's not gonna get better. So what are your suggestions on that? Well, let's remember that in between 2015 and 2016, Europe and particularly Germany let in more than 1 million, almost 2 million, uh, particularly Syrian asylum seekers and migrants. Right now, in the Polish border with Belarus, you have about eight or 10,000. It's a very small number. And I think given the season that it is right now in the winter time, it is so important to, as a humanitarian gesture, to allow these migrants in. It's a very, very small number. And of course, they are victims. They are truly victims of a terrible policy that Russia and other countries are perpetrating. I do not believe that that will create a moral hazard. I think it is morally wrong to not accept those migrants who are victims. And the bigger picture is also that if you look at Europe as a whole, one has to actually differentiate between the countries that are doing a good job of absorbing those migrants and countries that are not doing a good job. Greece and Italy are not doing a good job. Germany and Switzerland are doing a good job. Germany has just had an election and you have a center left coalition that is pro-migration. The right wing parties have been pushed out of uh, politics, uh, out of the federal government. And you have a growing labor force because they are actually training these newly arrived refugees to participate in the economy. So that's a good example of what countries, how countries can learn to do it right. And Europe will have to learn from the way in which Germany and Switzerland and other countries are allocating uh, migrants as they arrive. We'll see about that. So you say geography is not destiny. It's what we make of it. So you and you also say mobility is destiny. Could you elaborate on that? Absolutely. The reason that geography is no longer destiny is because we have built so much connectivity, so much infrastructure that enables our mobility. We are not stuck anywhere. We can move if sovereignty allows, if governments allow, if borders are better managed, if countries realize that migration can be good for them, depending on how many people, at what rate they are coming, what their backgrounds are. But investing our social capital, our societal resources in absorbing 
those populations is a very, very critical priority of policy. But no, geography is not destiny. Mobility is destiny. We have been a nomadic people, a nomadic species for 100,000 years. And the so fact do you think is that sovereign states are ready to absorb those migrants or refugees to create a labor force to, you know, uh, contribute to their economies. What's the mood there? Well, we know that it is happening all the time. The, the most respected states today are the ones that are doing that and benefiting from it. Canada and Germany. And don't forget Japan. Japan has just passed a law that is going to give permanent residency to all manner of, of temporary migrants, even people from India and Bangladesh who are construction workers will now have permanent residency in Japan. This is quite radical. So the most stable, respected, highly functional democracies like Canada, like Germany, like Japan are very friendly now towards migrants. They are integrating them and benefiting from their presence. So it's not a matter only of culture. It's a matter of politics, of policy, and of recognizing the long-term demographic needs of a country. Remember that when Turkish populations started moving into uh, West Germany and Austria and other parts of Western Europe in the 1950s, it was because there was a recognition that these countries needed to have Gastarbeiter, right, guest workers. Yeah, guest. And of course, they became a permanent feature of the population and they've enriched German society and culture. So a lot of countries think about migration as temporary, but in fact, it's very often permanent. So we must get used to that fact in advance and prepare yes. accordingly. So mobility and interconnectedness. I mean, what do you make of, for example, China's Belt and Road uh, project, which Turkey is also part of it? I mean, talk to us its, its significance. And because some argue that China is exerting its influence over poor countries, putting them in debt for the sake of multi-billion dollar investments and infrastructure. Do you agree that? Well, as you know, I wrote a previous book all about infrastructure and its geopolitical implications. That book was called Connectography. And I looked at Belt and Road very carefully. I have probably visited more Belt and Road projects than just about anyone. And I've been looking at the new Silk Roads for 25 years as a traveler. And I have found that, first of all, infrastructure is good. Infrastructure matters. Infrastructure is important. Infrastructure is a catalyst and a platform for growth. When infrastructure investments are made in a country, the GDP grows faster, jobs are created, and ultimately debt is reduced. There are countries that are already heavily indebted, either to multilateral organizations or to China or other countries, where the more they borrow, the more they are in debt, and they are not efficiently generating growth to pay off the debt. And then you will have uh, very significant transfers of ownership of assets, like what has just happened with the airport in Uganda, what happened with the port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka, and other examples. But those are very, very, very small examples. In the big countries where the most investment is going, places like Kazakhstan, like Uzbekistan, like Pakistan, uh, and Turkey as well. These are countries that can absorb the investment, that need the investment, that will make the most of the investment and benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So overall, we have to remember that infrastructure and infrastructure finance is one of the most important priorities of the 21st century. However, it should be done sustainably, both from an environmental standpoint and from a fiscal standpoint. So we're down to our last, uh, I think, two to three minutes. Um, could you talk to us about how COVID has impacted the world as a whole and has, how has it and still adding to the very core problems of the mankind? Yes. Well, COVID, even though it feels like it has been going on forever, it's been two years. And that is not abnormal for the history of pandemics and the amount of time that they take to play themselves out around the world. However, I do think that overall, COVID will have accelerated certain trends rather than stopping those trends. Number one, it has accelerated the regionalism of the world economy. In the middle of this pandemic one year ago, North American countries signed the United States, Canada, Mexico, 
trade agreement. The European countries moved from the monetary union that they already have into a fiscal compact and a very large common budget of nearly 1 trillion euro for the next seven years. In Asia, they have just signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, that uh, is going into effect uh, in 2022. It's the largest free, free trade framework in the entire world. Now, this is not an accident, right? During the pandemic, people said, we are going to lock down, look inward. That's not what happened. The three centers of the entire global economy signed three very significant measures to open regional economic integration. That's but not an accident. Regionalization you're because, talking about? Yes, regionalization, right? Looking to our neighbors and trading more and investing more with our neighbors because the global situation is so uncertain. And COVID has accelerated this regionalism. The second, of course, factor is digitization. COVID has massively accelerated digitization. And of course, we're experiencing that every day of our lives. And this is just the beginning, let's remember. Okay. And the final point, of course, is the resettlement of populations, because people will say that they don't want to live in a place that has poorly managed COVID. They want to live in a place where they can do remote work and these kinds of situations. So one fact for people to remember is that before COVID, only two countries had policies for nomad visas, right? welcoming people to come and be remote workers, attracting young people in particular to contribute to the economy. Today, 75 countries have nomad visa okay. arrangements. That is a huge increase. Yes. All right, uh, Praga, I'm unfortunately, we'll have to wrap it up here. It was a pleasure hosting you on the uh, CSA Talks and hope to be seeing you when you come back to Turkey. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you.